Hi, I'm Jacob Heilbrunn, the editor of The National Interest, and it is my great pleasure to welcome two colleagues and contributors to the website and magazine, Chip Gregson and Graham Allison. And I'm going to begin today's session by posing a question about Chinese foreign policy and how it's been influenced by the events that we now witness in Ukraine. We're hearing increased talk about the perils of nuclear escalation developing from Ukraine, the potential expansion of the war beyond the borders of Ukraine, and some, including or particularly in Moscow itself, are talking about the potential for a World War III developing from Russia's initial invasion into Ukraine, which the United States and the Western allies are now frantically trying to counter with massive shipments of aid and military equipment. I thought it would be a propitious moment to shift the angle a little and look at the Asian theater. China is obviously positioning itself as an ally of Russia. So the question naturally poses itself, how do the events in Ukraine shape Chinese foreign policy? And one area that there's a lot of speculation about is Taiwan. So I wanted to pose the initial question to our distinguished panelists, beginning with Chip Gregson, followed by Graham, which is, does Putin's invasion of Ukraine which so far appears to have gone badly awry, affect Chinese calculations about the possibility or desirability of actually invading Taiwan. Chip? Uh, thank you and good morning uh, to uh, all. I think one of the things that comes out of this is that uh, autocratic leaders who have been in office uh, with unchallenged uh, a tenure unchallenged authority are impervious to our systems of logic uh, on whether it makes sense or not. Of course, in our system, a uh, way of thinking of uh, things invading Ukraine doesn't make any sense for Russia because dot, 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 you can fill in all the blanks about the economy and international isolation and everything else, but it certainly didn't deter Vladimir Putin. Another lesson for China is that nuclear weapons deter direct American intervention. Uh, we've been sending equipment to, uh, to Ukraine. We have American volunteers that are fighting in Ukraine, but we don't have any American involvement directly in, in Ukraine, no boots on the ground as the phrase goes, because of Russia's successful uh, deterrence through their nuclear weapons of our involvement. We've said as much. Um, the mistakes that Russia has made will certainly be uh, studied by China. Uh, that doesn't mean that China thinks that they can uh, that they can't overcome the difficulties that uh, that Russia has encountered. So this this is not likely to slow them down much. Then there's the Russia-China competition. Despite their pledge of uh, of uh, eternal friendship to each other. The Russia incursions into the Kuril Islands in Japan's far north now have got to be coming to China's attention, and they're going to be wary of uh, Russian influence in what China considers their sphere of influence. Um, the, uh, uh, there are many lessons uh, on the American side, but uh, I'll leave those for later in our session. Graham, uh, General Gregson just made two interesting points, the one about logic that these autocratic leaders do not necessarily share the complacent assumptions of Western leaders. And the other, which we've witnessed before with the George W. Bush administration, which was reluctant to go after North Korea because of its nuclear weapons, that nuclear weapons really do deter the United States from direct involvement. What is with those points in mind, what is your take on Chinese calculations when it comes to Taiwan? 
Well, there are about 10 questions wrapped up here. So let me try to be brief and I'll make four or five points and try to underline some differences with Chip, whom I'm happy to be on the panel with and whose uh, writings and thinking about this, I appreciate. I think the proposition that autocrats who are in power for a long time are impervious to strategic logic is fundamentally wrong, fundamentally wrong. Uh, I think that uh, while I've spent a lot of time trying to analyze, quote, rational actors as compared to the other complexities in decision making, uh, I think it's as quite, it's more plausible to me that Putin would have done what he's done in Ukraine than it is that George W. Bush would have done what he did in invading Iraq, for example. So just to be provocative. So first, I disagree with that. Secondly, uh, with respect to nuclear weapons deterring, excuse me, that's what we learned in the Cold War. There was something called mutual assured destruction. Uh, Ronald Reagan, famously, for whom I worked with enthusiasm, said, a nuclear war cannot be won because at the end of a nuclear war with, a, 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 uh, with, a, with the Soviet Union in this case, our whole country would have disappeared. So nobody can call that victory. So a nuclear war cannot be won and then he said, the imperative that follows from that, must therefore never be fought. So that meant, as he explained, we had to live with lots of things we hate, even an evil empire, which we were serious about attempting to bury, but mm -hmm. without a war, because a war that could become a nuclear war would be destructive mm -hmm. of ourselves, of us, of our society. That would be a failure. So that's something we learned to live with in the Cold War. We nonetheless competed within a set of constraints. And I think that's something we have to understand as we're dealing with a Russia whose nuclear arsenal is as adequate as ever the evil empires was for erasing the US from the map. Now, North Korea becomes a slightly different question, which I'm happy to talk about too. And the Chinese piece of this is another interesting question. Even for China, as the Nuclear Posture Review in the Bush administration concluded, and the, and the Nuclear Posture Review in the, in the Obama administration confirmed, has an arsenal which, after we've done our best to disarm it, can still destroy the US as a functioning society. So with China as well as, the, as Russia, we live in a condition of what, what uh, nuclear strategists came to call mutual assured destruction. And that has all these consequences for the necessities for constraint and care, and in particular, not getting dragged into something that could be uh, escalate to a war that nobody wanted. And that's what I think we've seen President Biden, who is actually a seasoned Cold Warrior, who understands very well that a nuclear war cannot be won and must therefore never be fought being so cautious about being dragged into a direct conflict with Russian troops, which could ultimately end in escalating to a nuclear war. And just one last point on this, uh, Jacob, because I think a bit of history will help us here. The decision that President Biden has made about not sending American troops to fight Russians is very similar to the decision George W. Bush made in 2008, when after a provocation, Putin invaded Georgia and his troops were actually moving towards Tbilisi. And there was a famous meeting at the National Security Council at which Cheney and a bunch of people who worked for him had been talking about, well, the US should send forces to defend Georgia. And Hadley, who was the National Security Advisor, uh, proposed to President Bush and President Bush said to all the members sitting at the table, there's only one question on the table, should we send American troops to fight for Georgia? Yes or no? And he went around the table and had everybody answer. Cheney's back and forth, no, okay. Condi, no. Gates, no. Not a single vote, yes there. So that's quite similar to the decision that other presidents made in previous cases, for example, Eisenhower, when the Hungarians rose up in 1956 uh, and were crushed by Soviet 
uh, as they came back to reinstall their, you know, the govern their puppet government. So I think that the uh, proposition <coughs> that American presidents, when faced with the question of sending American troops to fight Russians on a path that could escalate to a nuclear war, for anything short of American national interest, is one that presidents have consistently answered and where I believe they've correctly answered it. So sorry, that's walking around three different points, but you ask about five different questions. Yeah. Well, the uh, the main question I was interested in is, um, <clears throat> what is your analysis of the Taiwan issue? Is, ta is China more or less likely to invade at this point, given the events in Ukraine? Well, I would say less, okay, and why? Uh, and I, I would, unfortunately, I have seven reasons, but I'll just go briefly. I think that a while, uh, as I wrote in your magazine, uh, uh, I believe she and China will have Russia's back through this, throughout. Nonetheless, watching what's going on, I think they have to be worrying about a number of things. My list would just say, first, it turns out military operations are much more complex, especially integrated military operations, than they might have imagined. And Russia, even though it was advertising its new modernized military capability, their ability to integrate air and land and intelligence has been abysmal. Secondly, Russian weapons, uh, many of which Chinese are armed with, don't seem to be working very well. Third, US intelligence has been pretty remarkable here. I think the ability to get inside of, uh, uh, of uh, Putin's decision loop, uh, the ability to wrong foot him on uh, many points has got to make the Chinese think, maybe Americans have become more intelligent than we thought. Maybe they have a, maybe they penetrated even our system more than we thought. I think next, the temper, American technology and oper, operational assistance. I mean, the sinking of the Moskva was a big event. This was by a so-called uh, Ukrainian missile, the Neptune. I presume there was some considerable American uh, assistance in that. Well, uh, what about amphibious landing ships coming to Taiwan? Uh, Taiwan's cruise missile equivalents, uh, I'm, certainly, I'm certain they're looking at again. Uh, finally, or, or fifth in the fin financial area, I think the response that the Biden administration has mounted, which basically is is uh, uh, surround or is strangling uh, slowly but tightening the noose around Putin's economy, has got to have them worried about possibly setting off some financial crisis, which would create instability. And sixth is social media. Basically, this plays on social media, this war for everybody, including Chinese citizens. All of the young you know, cosmopolitans have no trouble getting around the, uh, the, their, their Chinese firewall. And if the impact of this on their, on their citizenry, they have to, they're watching very carefully. They're listening to the WeChat conversation where many young people are seeing this pretty much like Americans are seeing it, much more like it than their government is seeing it. And finally, uh, the way in which the Biden administration, I think for the first time I've seen any administration, essentially uh, making Putin and the Putinistas, the people that support Putin, pariahs in the world, certainly worries global Chinese who think that they're part of the world and want to be part of the world and worry we could do something like this to them. So net of, net of it for me is he's having second thoughts and the, chain, the PLA, which loves to study things, wants to study longer and they need more time to prepare. So since what I'm playing for is time, I would say good for us, yeah. Chip, you've been patiently waiting. I wonder what your uh, assessment and response is. Well, there's all sorts of reasons uh, that we can argue that it wouldn't be wise for China to invade Taiwan. But one thing we need to do is uh, clarify our policy. Strategic ambiguity has had its day. We need to make sure that they understand, that uh, everybody understands what our position is vis-a-vis uh, -vis the security of Taiwan. And this is not just us thinking uh, the former prime minister of Japan has even weighed in publicly saying that uh, 
our policy must be clarified. And I agree with that. Uh, we need to, uh, the lesson of uh, Ukraine's resistance relates to Taiwan too. And we can do better by Taiwan and becoming more overt about our training, our training with the Taiwanese. And there's a number of defensive measures that we can help uh, Taiwan to implement. And none of this is a threat to China. But Chip, we, I, oh, go ahead. I, I was wondering when you were, when you, we were talking earlier, what, what is you, we were talking about the logic of this and Graham disputed you. And I was wondering what your response is to that. Uh, I understand all of, of Graham's uh, uh, reasons, uh, but again, I think that it's hard for us uh, to understand what the internal pressures are, what the psychology is of somebody who's been the supreme leader for so long. I don't think we can count on China being reasonable. I don't think we should. I think we need an insurance policy. And like I said, it's time for us to change our policy toward Taiwan. Uh, President Biden actually spoke the truth when a reporter got him with the usual gotcha question, will the United States defend Taiwan? Uh, Biden answered in the affirmative. And then we were greeted with the demeaning but ever present bureaucratic process of staff hustling to say what the president meant to say was. That doesn't do our deterrence any good. That doesn't do us uh, uh, any favors to defend a policy that was good in its day when it started with uh, the KMT uh, arguing to go back to the mainland, et cetera, et cetera. We're long past that. We need to change the policy to fit the times. Graham, do you, do you agree? No, I think that's fundamentally wrong. So let me uh, explain why. And then uh, uh, Chip and I maybe, or you jump in and, you know, do another, do another round. I think it is more likely that we provoke uh, China uh, to invasion by quote, clarifying strategic ambiguity, which is, I think, a bad idea, uh, uh, than that we defend them. That we're more, we'll be more successful in provoking than in deterring. And actually, I think there was quite a good piece in the national interest by another one of your folks there, Paul, here on this, which I think was fundamentally right. So let me go through this one more time, because I think just to, for the other people, and then try to get Chip to help me help, help, help explain why to disagree. So in Georgia, let's take the case of 2008. And actually, I wrote a short piece about this in your competition for foreign affairs uh, back uh, a month ago. And I went through the history of it. In Georgia, uh, President Bush and his administration uh, made what I think was a uh, a blunder in trying to uh, rush Georgia and Ukraine into NATO. Uh, fortunately, there was some adult supervision. Uh, Chancellor Merkel basically said, forget about it. So it was vetoed at the, uh, uh, at the 2008 NATO uh, 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 um, summer meeting. Uh, but in any case, this, the idea that the US might have his back emboldened the Georgian president, Shakashvili, he then cracked down on the Russian ethnics in Georgia. That was a provocation that Putin was not prepared to live with. Putin sent his forces into mm -hmm. Georgia and invaded, just what I said. And now the question was up to the US, do we want to fight Russians for Georgia? And the answer President Bush gave was no, which was the same answer President Obama gave when Putin invaded Crimea. And it's the same argument, same answer that uh, President Biden has given with respect to Ukraine, because we have no vital national interest there. We've not made an Article 5 NATO commitment to any of those countries, wisely in my view. And uh, we understand that if we were to fight Russians uh, in an all out war, that could escalate to World War III, and World War III could be nuclear Armageddon, and now go back to Reagan, but nuclear war cannot be won. So that's the logic, logic chain in this. Now, with respect to Taiwan, uh, I think the policy that was developed by the Nixon administration 
uh, and Kissinger, uh, and represented in the uh, uh, Shanghai communique and the subsequent, has been a great policy for the US and for China and for Taiwan. Uh, the five decades under this regime have been the best five decades people on either side of the Straits have ever seen. So I believe that our objective now should be to shore up this uh, strategic ambiguity in which on the one hand, uh, we assert that Taiwan is not an independent country and cannot be an independent country. Uh, Thai, we have one China, one China policy, but on the other hand, that a Chinese attempted to change that status quo by force would be unacceptable and we would come to the defense of Taiwan, but the details to be developed, that's strategic ambiguity, and that we need to live with that for the foreseeable future. So that needs to be refreshed, I believe. And I think the lesson for Taiwan should be that they should become like a porcupine, which of course is what we've said to them for 25 years, that they'll seem to want to be a porcupine. But this would be a better reason for them to see that even a country as small and weak as Ukraine, which has been much smaller and weaker relatively to the Taiwan, which is a very successful society, has shown itself to build a capability and a will to be able to defend itself substantially. So I think if they took it, if they looked at the Neptunes and said, what about their DF-3s? And if they had enough uh, uh, shore to ship missiles to make a amphibious landing uh, uh, likely to fail, that would significantly impact their security. We should be helping them in that. If they were more serious about air defense, we should be helping them in that. So I think that there's a lot of lessons for them here in terms of strengthening their own defense and ours in helping to strengthen their defense, but not, not provoking a Chinese action against Taiwan, because I think if we were to do so at this point, uh, all the war games I've ever seen played, and the one that was played most recently by the vice chairman uh, of the JCS, have us in the local contingency losing. I feel like we should give Chip a, a chance to respond briefly. Please. Well, I'll just respond to a couple of points there. Uh, when Kissinger and Nixon came up with that policy, that China had absolutely no ability to project force beyond their, their beachheads. They, they, they could not project force to sea. Uh, that has profoundly changed now. Uh, secondly, the uh, uh, policy or the documents, uh, the founding documents of our policy about all this indicate not only no use of force, but no coercion. Uh, China is certainly engaging in coercion on, uh, against uh, Taiwan with their activities, uh, both uh, overt and covert. Uh, third, we agree on Taiwan uh, investing more in their defense. Uh, there's eight concrete areas where they need to do that. They're not, uh, they're not without capabilities in these eight areas, but as we see in Ukraine, uh, they can do more. Ballistic missile defense, air defense, sea denial fires, shore denial fires, mine warfare, information warfare, civil defense, and resilience of critical infrastructure. We need to do a much greater effort on this. And it's going to involve breaking the Taiwan security environment out of its isolation that it's endured since uh, 1979. Uh, and again, we're, we need to do an active bit of, uh, of training with the Taiwanese to help develop their capabilities. Uh, Taiwan is an absolute vital interest for the United States. Our alliances in Asia hinge on that. We don't need to be belligerent with China about this, but one of the lessons about policy over the years is we need to clarify what we mean. And we're far from clarification when we get the spectacles of the president saying something and then the staff saying that's not what he meant to say. And that's, that's not good for our allies and it's not good for us. Well, we have, I'm pleased to say we have some very good questions that uh, lead logically from uh, the points that Graham and Wallace Gregson have been making. And I will couple two questions. Uh, the first is from Walt Slocum, who notes, if China determined to invade Taiwan, 
they could threaten that if the US or any other third country assists Taiwan's defense, that they in turn risk a Chinese nuclear strike. And we have a related question from Joseph Bosco, who asks quite bluntly, if China invaded Taiwan, should the United States come directly to its defense? Why don't we kick it off with Graham and then go to, to uh, Chip? So uh, great questions and uh, glad to hear from both of these colleagues. Uh, 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 first on Walt's question, which I think is a good one. Uh, uh, if China uh, invaded Taiwan, well, let me go back. What, what could lead China to invade Taiwan? Uh, the Chinese have been absolutely clear about this a unambiguous declaration of independence by Taiwan and or a US recognition of an independent Taiwan. So Chinese say that would provoke an invasion of Taiwan. All the people that I know who study China mostly agree with that, okay? So now, if there were an invasion of Taiwan, what will the US do? And the answer is will be in a fix. By the Taiwan, Relations Act, we have agreed that we will provide defensive assistance to them. We've not, not agreed that we would fight for them. We've not given them, a, established a treaty relationship with them. We've not given them an Article 5 commitment. And the reason why is because we do not, have not believed they were, uh, that there, that, that we had a vital national interest in Taiwan. Now, there's a good question to argue about that, and Chip has a different view about that. I think that's a debatable debate, but a debatable issue, but I agree with what has been our position. So if we came to their assistance, not in nuclear terms, but just a, a battle over Taiwan, that has been war-gamed many times in the Pentagon. Bob Work, the Deputy Secretary, has talked about it very explicitly. And as he said, in the 18 last games, and there's two more since then, in each one of those games, if the war is a local war in Taiwan, we lose, okay? Because the game is essentially over before we get there. This is a hundred miles off the shore of China and is around the world for us. So we don't get a chance to prepare for the war if it were just to happen the way we did for the war in the Middle East. So that's a situation that's just given there. This is a little bit like Cuba uh, in, the, in the Soviet Union, which a country or a country right next door to the US and halfway around the world from, a, from another country is extremely difficult for the country at a distance to defend. So there's the conventional. What about the nuclear piece of this? I think the likelihood in that case that China would say, and if you do something like this, we'll conduct a nuclear strike against you, puts you into the realm of be unthinkable again, but nobody has ever actually ever done that in the past. China could be that reckless, but with an arsenal of the minimum size they have and a theory of deterrence, which they hold to, which is essentially a minimum, a minimum deterrence perspective in which they have about, I don't know, the IAS says three or 400 weapons and we have three or 4,000 weapons. That's not a, not a game that they would be likely to play. I think on the, on the question of if China did invade Taiwan, what should we do? Uh, the question is, that'll be a extremely painful choice for any American president, because he'll look at the choices and say, if we come to their defense and fight China over Taiwan, we'll likely lose the local war and have to choose and, and raise it. And the question will be, do we want to have a wider war? And if we widen the war to the Blue Seas, we will continue to own the Blue Seas. So uh, we can do it substantially better there. And if it escalates to something like a nuclear war, again, in this case, a nuclear war can't be won. So you're playing out a, a nightmare scenario. So I think the crucial thing is to prevent uh, a invasion of Taiwan that would lead to a war. And that's why I think finding a way to build uh, Taiwan or help Taiwan build its own defensive posture, plus wrapping it 
in the strategic ambiguity that we've had to date, that's provided for us five decades without a war, is the right policy. Now, Chip, if I understand you, you think that's flatly wrong, an antediluvian view, and we need to move into the future and call China's bluff. Is that correct? Uh, that's extending out from my remarks, and I'll have to look up antediluvian, but uh, uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to mention. One, I think Graham's optimistic. Uh, we don't own the seas anymore. Uh, our sea control is definitely contested. Our air control is definitely contested. So anything that happens in the theater there is going to have to include campaign planning and efforts to uh, first achieve sea and air denial and then to achieve sea and air control. Secondly, there's no guarantee at all. Matter of fact, there's likelihood it'll go the other way. No conflict that starts in Asia is going in one spot in Asia is likely to remain in Asia. You mentioned North Korea when we were chatting before we went on the air. Uh, North Korea is likely to act out. Russia is likely to act out and use it as a chance to hive off one of the Kuril Islands or something. All these things are possible. So we have to be very careful of what we're doing here. Third, Taiwan is not defenseless. Uh, we have some history of island nations defending themselves against continental hegemons. Uh, Germany at the height of its powers in 1940 could not get across the English Channel when Great Britain was literally on its knees having, uh, having the British Expeditionary Force destroyed uh, on the continent. Uh, Malta, Britain thought so much about Malta's chances to withstand invasion that they made no preparations prior to World War II to defend Malta. Malta, Malta hung on successfully for, uh, against brutal onslaughts by the uh, Germans and Malta is a small island. So uh, Taiwan's got a lot of things going for it that make it something uh, much more formidable than, than, than just a uh, great. So, uh, third, the idea of uh, confining our involvement in an invasion in Taiwan to Taiwan, I think is, is not wise. Uh, we would be fighting in a phone booth, so to speak, and we would not be taking advantage of our allies, nor would we be taking advantage of um, our, our capabilities. Uh, the first island chain is a remarkable geographic feature. There are, I think, seven straits that allow the big, big commercial carriers to get in and out of the East and the South China Sea into the greater Indian Ocean or the greater Pacific to uh, bring container ships full of stuff from China to us and various other things. We can uh, achieve control of those straits, among other things, while we're uh, exercising sea denial and eventually sea control. And we could shut down China's ability to trade while at the same time protecting Japan's sea lines of communications. Uh, there's a lot to put together in this, but it, but it, uh, it, it uh, has the advantage of creating a position where China might want to seek conflict termination on acceptable terms so that their businesses can make money again. Uh, that's, that's a great oversimplification, but there've been a lot of writings about this, particularly at the National Defense University that talk about this horizontal escalation as being a plausible response. Uh, Graham, I- Can I do two footnotes briefly? Just first yes. one, uh, as Chip, as Chip has written about this, and I think I agree, but then disagree. Air and sea control in the theater as Mattis says absolutely clearly in the national defense strategy is an illusion of the past. And it's actually uh, uh, the kind of illusion of unipolarity about which Chip has written intelligently and that I agree with strongly. So trying to reestablish air and sea control in the 100 mile gap between China and Taiwan is a fool's errand. That's not going to happen. In air and sea control in, a broad, in, in the wider blue seas, much more plausible. And as you say, there's these seven gaps that are not that hard to mine if you were serious about mining and are not that hard to interrupt if you're serious about interrupting. And then there's a long path that goes to the Persian Gulf to get oil and that goes to San Diego to drop off goods. So I would say that's a big, that's a very important part of our advantage in this and one that should be strengthened. Uh, then f finally, I think though, on the question of if we were to close off 
Chinese uh, shipping to the West to, that is basically of their goods that they manufacture. This will cause economic pain to them. And it'll also cause Walmart and uh, Home Depot and Target to be empty. And Chinese say, and I think it's a reasonable question, which do you think of the two societies will be more enthusiastic about suffering? Um, we have a question from Robert Hormatz, which is, can anyone explain why China agreed prior to the Olympics that their cooperation with Russia, quote, has no limits, unquote. That Beijing is normally quite cautious in the words that it uses in these communiques. What do you suppose Putin told them to convince the Chinese to agree to such language? And what does it mean? Chip? Uh, not being able to read either Vladimir Putin's mind or Xi Jinping's mind, uh, I really have no basis to answer that. As a guess, it might be that uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Graham? Well, uh, I happen to have written an article for your magazine called, published on the 25th of January, of February, just at the time of the invasion, called Ukraine Crisis. Will China have Putin's back? And the piece, the part of it that I like the best, and Bob, you'll, you'll like if you look at it, is I tried to uh, imagine the briefing slide, the briefing slides that were presented to Xi before his meeting on February 5th, at which he announced this uh, no limits partnership. That was something that actually was drafted by the Chinese government. So if you look at it, I have two charts, one advantages for China if Russia invades, and the second chart is called disadvantages for China. I made this first for some folks in the administration, but then as I say, but it was now timely, I put it out. There's nothing, nothing classified about it, but if you look at it from the Russian point of view, I start with the killer advantages, and you'll find the first 10 advantages, it says, quote, the U.S. will not be focused on us. That's the first 10 reasons why this is a good idea from China. As the chairman has repeatedly reminded us, I'm just reading from the chart, what we need most from the U.S. is just one thing, inattention. Fortunately, the U.S. system is unable to focus on more than one threat at a time. So, dot, dot, dot. The next... Uh, five reasons, advantages for China. Putin's military success will create for American military planners the specter of a two-front war. So when they're worrying about Taiwan, they'll also have to worry about, as Chip said, what Putin might do in Europe, and they'll be focused on that. And then finally, the next five reasons are this will solidify a Russia's position as our junior partner and uh, the resources which they're providing, oil, gas, wheat, whatever, will flow to China reliably, not uh, elsewhere. So basically institutionalizing the relationship with Russia as, a, as their most important partner, but in effect as a vassal in the traditional Chinese fashion. There's a lot of disadvantages for China, and you'll see that in the other chart, but I think net of this, uh, she thinks this is working okay for him, as long as Putin does not lose. If Putin should lose, and certainly if Putin should be ousted, then he would have made a very bad bet. And I therefore, I, I, I said at the time, and I believe we'll see China having Putin's back right through, the, right through this, uh, to a point where whenever it is resolved, uh, the Chinese-Russian alliance, undeclared alliance, will be seen again further as operationally the most significant alliance that's been built in recent times. Well, this takes us into another question that I wanted to pose to both of you gentlemen, which is as the talk about a potential tactical 
nuclear strike on Ukraine by Russia should its operation in the Donbass be perceived to be failing? Were Putin to go to extremities, what would the Chinese position be? Would they have their own red line with Russia and say, we don't want you going further than this? Or would they say nothing? Or do they have, in fact, no influence over Russian national security decisions at that level? Chip, why don't you start? I don't, I'm, I'm not sure we know what we would do if uh, Russia huh? reverted to, uh, to a nuclear strike on, on Ukraine. Uh, I'm, I would uh, leave the assessment of uh, uh, Chinese thinking on that to Graham. Graham? Well, I, I think that uh, this is a nightmare arena. So again, trying to, I, I've actually been trying to think about uh, what we would do. And therefore, since they're not very good options, what could we do now? to try to prevent that, to deter it. Uh, and again, it's pretty hard, hard to think about. I think from the Chinese perspective, uh, the Chinese uh, thinking about nuclear weapons and their role in international affairs has been radically different from our own. And they haven't bought into the theories that we have had for a long time either about the necessity for huge nuclear arsenals. How could somebody have sat around the way they did with actually a vulnerable nuclear capability uh, up until a, to a dozen years ago, or in currently with a capability to have only uh, say 300 weapons that might reach American soil as opposed to thousand plus that we would do. So they, they've had this minimum deterrence idea uh, I am afraid that as they listen to our talking so much, they may be persuaded by our theory of the case. I liked it when they held to their theory that basically nuclear weapons are not usable for anything except a response to a nuclear attack. And if they would hold to that, we'd be better off. But I'm afraid, as you can see in the development of their program now, which I think is uh, on, uh, uh, on course to probably have a thousand weapons by the end of the decade. Uh, they're moving to something closer to where we were before. What would be the impact on China? I mean, for sure, Putin and Xi talk all the time. So this is a very tight relationship. Uh, they've met to personally 38 times. The first person Xi went to visit when he became president uh, was Putin. Uh, uh, She's the only person Putin ever had that celebrated his birth, only foreign leader that celebrated his birthday with him. So this is a very, a very tight relationship. So will they have talked, would they talk about it? Yes, they would. Would this be a pretty desperate act on the part of Putin? You bet. I mean, this would be, you know, look, I'm going to lose otherwise. So I've got to raise the level of destruction. What impact would this have on perception, I mean, I think China would think about what impact does this have on perceptions of nuclear weapons role in international affairs. Unfortunately, a big conclusion that most nations are drawing from what's happening is that Ukraine would be much better off if it had a nuclear deterrent. <laughs> so, uh, but since China already lives in a neighborhood with Indian and Pakistani and North Korean nuclear weapons, of course, they'll be worried about implications for Japan and implications for South Korea, even implications for Taiwan, okay? Uh, so I would say that if, it, if asked for advice, they would say, this is not a good idea, but if it should happen, uh, I don't know what their options are yet. Let me put it as simply as possible in thinking about what we've been discussing so far. It occurs to me that the United States had a lot of governors that it imposed on its actions toward Ukraine over the past decade. We weren't really willing to send them heavy weaponry. We were 
We didn't want to antagonize the Russians. Then as the conflict has proceeded, we have steadily upped the ante in Ukraine and crossed all of these inhibitions that previously, previously existed. And this is clearly President Joe Biden grew, grew up during the Cold War, is clearly more mindful of, of the risks of a nuclear war than uh, many in Washington, where I think time has eroded memories of the nuclear standoff and how dangerous it was during the Cold War. But we are now at a point in Ukraine where you have the New York Times and the Washington Post openly writing about this is the most dangerous moment since the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, when we look at Asia, could something similar happen? Could we, if the Chinese attacked Taiwan, would we progressively up the ante and then run the risk of nuclear escalation? Chip? Well, we've seen uh, our deterrence fail in Ukraine. Uh, Putin was not deterred by uh, our threat of sanctions. Putin wasn't deterred by our threat of providing aid to Ukraine to resist the Russian effort. And now we're in, uh, in a, uh, a contest, uh, the outcome of which is not clear yet on uh, whether we can help the Ukrainians prevail, well, however we define prevail, uh, which gets into the temptation for tactical nuclear weapons. So could the same type of scenario develop in, in Asia? Yes. Uh, we need not only to work on deterrence policies, but uh, if deterrence fails, we've got to develop some compellence technologies with our allies so that we can actually compel the outcome we want uh, and it would not involve nuclear escalation. Uh, easy to say tough to do, but uh, we also see that the results of not doing that when deterrence fails are not good either. Graham? A great question and uh, uh, extremely complicated. And here, for, for those who are old cold warriors, these are back to the issues that I used to wrestle with many, many years ago. And you were hoping that they had been put into a into a casket and you know left on the side but nuclear weapons didn't go away and the challenges that they provide have not gone away so in the first instance if we look at the at the ukraine uh crisis uh, uh you're certainly right that uh, uh what had been anticipated to be a very short war in which uh, uh Putin would have, Putin's forces would have been successful. Uh, surprisingly, thanks to the uh, remarkable resistance of courageous Ukrainians and their fierce, uh, brave fighters and the uh, assistance that they have been provided over the period of time, they've shown themselves to be able to blunt Putin's uh, initial effort. And I think currently uh, our while the second round of Putin's uh, conflict with Ukraine is going more successfully from the Russian perspective, it's still been very impressive. And in that context, the US has gone across a number of red, a number of, I don't know, pink lines that we had drawn before with respect to more heavy uh, 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 weaponry uh, for, for Ukraine. But not, I think, that Jacob, you, the way you had said it, not uh, as some of the newspapers are reporting across what he understands to be red lines that could most likely lead to conflict directly with Russian forces, namely no, no fly zone. Because we have another uh, question from uh, Joseph Bosco, who asks, why does fear of nuclear war only deter the United States from provocation and reckless talk? Do we assume that both China and Russia are cavalier and suicidal? Chip? Uh, I'm not sure they're cavalier or suicidal, but uh, Graham has uh, cited Henry Kissinger 
a couple of times. Henry Kissinger also took us to DEFCON 3 uh, over a uh, fight in the, uh, in the Middle East to deter Soviet intervention. So there's still a role here for nuclear weapons. And that's part of what I was talking about on a strategy of compellence. We need to uh, do more work on this because right now, as Joe Bosco says, we're only deterring ourselves. Graham? Oh, no, I, I think again, unless I misinterpret Joe's question, uh, basically uh, the uh, Putin has shown a great uh, fear of nuclear war. He has not attacked any NATO country. He's not attacked any NATO country. He realizes the likelihood that that would lead to a conflict with the U.S. that could escalate to a nuclear war. And he understands at the end of a nuclear war, Mother Russia, whatever he imagines he cares about, would be gone. And that's a good thing to keep reminding him of. I think in the Chinese case, they have shown no interest whatever uh, in attacking any American vital national interests, and they haven't. So they understand as well that a nuclear war with the U.S. would be suicidal, or any war with the U.S. would be suicidal. I think that's a good thing to keep reminding them of. So I, I see them to be uh, fully deterred by our nuclear posture uh, against things that we have defined as our vital interests credibly. And even though I think some of the expansion of NATO uh, uh, included countries that I would wish we had not have done, they would be therefore in a less you know, secure uh, zone. Uh, but the question of, I, I start here with American national interests first. Uh, nonetheless, I think we have not seen any Russian action against the U.S. national, vital national interests that would uh, lead them to think that that could lead to a war that could lead to a nuclear war, nor with China. So I think that the, the parties have understood the dangers of direct war between the parties and of nuclear war. And I think that's a good thing for, for them to be reminded of. There's a lot of speculation in Washington that Russia may be finished as a major power. Uh, it is embroiled in a war that it can't win. You have the expansion of NATO now in, in Finland and Sweden. And you have what European ambassadors here, I was at one embassy yesterday, the ambassador said, you know, a decoupling is taking place between Europe and Russia. The economic ties are being severed and the sanctions will begin to bite. The Russian economy is taking a real hit. Is this all in China's interest? Is Russia going to be reduced to a vassal status towards Beijing? Or is too weak a Russia not a good thing for China? What, what is your assessment, Chip? A declining Russia uh, with nuclear weapons is not a pleasant thought to, uh, to contemplate. Um, we've thought before that we were done with uh, um, pressures from the Soviet Union when it went away and that uh, Russia was going to become a different uh, beast. We had the reset with Russia famously, uh, all these things. I'm not ready to write them off yet. And uh, anybody that's threatening uh, nuclear weapons as uh, Russia is, uh, we have to do some deep thinking about how to react to that. Interesting on vital interest. Uh, we all recall the Chernobyl episode uh, with massive amounts of radiation that floated into Europe harmfully. Uh, what do we think would be the outcome of uh, a nuclear burst uh, in, uh, in, in Ukraine, particularly a dirty weapon? Uh, we have vital interest uh, at stake then with this radiation cloud develop, uh, drifts over NATO, the new NATO uh, coming or the old NATO. Um, there's a lot to unpack here and uh, uh, we need to be careful about writing off Russia as uh, you know, part of the great uh, 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 episodes of the past. It's not past yet. It still has the potential to visit a lot of evil on the world. Graham? So again, Washington, uh, 
I fortunately don't live in, and I would say most of Washington is nuts most of the time, okay? So, and so the, the, the runs through Washington, these, these sort of theories or, well, Russia is finished, okay? And uh, we can forget about it, to which the answer is, excuse me, Russia has a superpower nuclear arsenal that is commanded by a fellow named Putin, which if used, will cause Washington to disappear. Do it again, disappear, all gone, completely. Actually, it will cause the US to disappear, all gone, completely. So as, Chuck, as Chip said, don't forget about that. That oh, Maybe they're gone, maybe they don't really matter. Right? Anybody that can cause me to disappear has a special claim upon a president of the US and upon our national security standards. That's the first point. Second point, I think that the, the, what, the, what the Biden administration is trying to do and what I think they may succeed in doing in this case is showing that this Putin's war was a folly, was a stupid, a stupid error, and that it's going to be a big strategic failure for Russia. Not going to cause Russia to go away, but will be seen in which after the war ends whenever and wherever it ends. Russia will be seen as the loser strategically and Ukraine and the US and the West as the winner. And at the net of it, if you look at whatever they gained and whatever they lost will be a huge loss over, over everything. NATO went away? No, NATO stronger. US and Europe uh, you splintered? No, US and Europe together. Uh, Russian economy, crippled for a very substantial part of time, as you say, even decoupled from a lot. Russia consigned to being a very junior partner uh, and essentially vassal support, supplier of natural resources for China. So from, the, from, from the, the, the international lesson from this should be, this kind of crime doesn't pay. And I hope that's what we succeed in teaching. Final question for our two panelists, beginning with Chip Gregson. Is Joe Biden doing a good job in handling China? Yes, uh, but can be improved. Um, one other comment, uh, not directly related to your question, but uh, this might not be the war uh, right now. It might be the first campaign in a war that's destined to expand. But there's no guarantee that Putin's going to be satisfied with just whatever he can get out of Ukraine. Moldova is clearly in his sights. Uh, and from there, who, who knows where it goes? Uh, secondly, he's being watched by fellow travelers in North Korea, China, and others uh, for their chance to take advantage of U.S. preoccupation. So uh, uh, the Ukrainian resistance is, yes, it's heroic. The, uh, the U.S. assistance to Ukraine is... Uh, uh, close to decisive and has got to continue and even accelerate, but uh, this might not be the end of it. It's not going to be, it might not stay confined to where it is. Thank you. Graham, is, is Joe Biden doing a good job? Well, uh, I would say yes. Uh, and I think with respect to China, uh, he is following on what I think is the recognition of the US government that China will be the biggest challenge the US faces for the foreseeable future, not just for this year, but for the decade, for people's lifetimes, that the China is a rival that is, I, in my terms, a Thucydidean rival, that is a rapidly rising power that's seriously threatening America's position as the predominant ruling power, and that that's the fundamental tectonics that an American government is going to have to deal with for the foreseeable future. And I think that in attempting to uh, have a strategy that stands firmly on two legs, first, strengthen the US, because we can never be stronger abroad than we are here at home. That's our fundamental problem. And that's the one that he's working on. That's quite difficult. And there's another subject there. And secondly, understanding that allies are essential in this. We have to have other countries allied and aligned sitting on our side of the seesaw. And what's been demonstrated in the uh, in the resistance to and what will ultimately be the defeat of Putin's aggression in Ukraine 
is that allies can stand together, quite a lot of them, not just the US and Europe, but Japan's uh, and South Korea and Australia. So basically that the building of the alliances as force multipliers is an essential part of what's ultimately gonna be a counterbalance to China for a long-term competition with China. So I think he's on, on the right track. Well, I'd like to thank both of our panelists for a excellent and at times contentious, but revealing and illuminating discussion. Graham and Chip, thank you very much. I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. With that, we conclude our session.